Good morning, everyone. I'm Bridget Mahoney, the immediate past chair of the Ohio Domestic Violence Network. Welcome to those of you here in person today and those of you who are out there in virtual land. We are so happy to have you here today. And we wanna thank the ODBN committee who put this together today, all the organizing that they did, the technical aspects, they have done a spectacular job. So first off, I wanna give them a round of applause. Thank you. So speaking of applause, those of you out there virtually, you will be able to hear us, the speaker, but you will not be able to hear the applause in the audience. So I just wanna say what a pleasure it is to be here among the best and the brightest group of people. You are all making a difference as you bring your dedication and strong conviction together as a team with the goal of eliminating domestic violence. Our team, the ODBN board, a wonderful blend of diverse people from programs in the community, the amazing ODBN staff that is so talented, forward thinking and action oriented, and our supportive elected officials and our colleagues from the other agencies also fighting the good fight. And among us today, our unsung heroes, our program people, the 75 programs helped more than 111,000 survivors last year, nearly 9,000 children. Those numbers represent nearly 10% of Ohio's population. Our program people, you are the highly skilled, passionate and committed leaders on the front lines on a daily basis who somehow seem to pull it together through thick and thin. A job that is normally tough got even tougher this past year, but you persevered through devastating budget cuts for the third year in a row, through the pandemic and the challenge of keeping everyone safe, and through the increase in intensity of the violence that has hit you to your core. But you rise to the occasion no matter what. You show up every day your doors never close. You are there to ease the fears, the pain, the isolation. You provide food and shelter, support and encouragement. Many times you are the difference between a life saved and a life lost. And you made a difference in getting a line item in the state budget with your grassroots advocacy efforts you communicated with your legislators and brought them into the shelters to see what it is like firsthand. Thank you to the program people and everyone for the work that's being done. Our voices united have become louder and stronger and we are being heard. We're celebrating that line item today and to speak about how some of the funding is being spent is our training director, Alicia Williamson. Good morning, everyone. We've learned some important lessons from domestic violence survivors about their experiences during the pandemic. In particular, some survivors told us how difficult it was to access services during the lockdown. For those who are monitored, stalked, and never alone, calling the crisis line is not always the best option. Sending a chat or a text provides a safer way for survivors to reach out for help. Some of our member programs already have this feature, and I am pleased to announce that today, ODBN is launching our very own chat program for survivors across the state. Survivors who visit our website will have the ability to connect with a staff member during our office hours. We are encouraging all of our programs to do this. In these lean financial times, you may be wondering how your program can possibly afford to do something new. ODBN used its new DB line item funding, and we are encouraging all of our member programs to do the same to raise the profile in their communities and reach even greater number of survivors in need of services. In the early days of the pandemic, ODVN in partnership with the Office of Criminal Justice Services created a hotel program. 
that expanded the capacity of our shelters, many of which were full or operating at reduced capacity because of social distancing requirements. Many programs have used the hotel program to shelter survivors who have been exposed to COVID or had health issues that meant that they could not stay in a shelter. Since the pandemic began, ODBN's hotel programs has sheltered more than 1,125 survivors, including, thank you, including 483 children. I like to thank Melissa Darby, Director of Grants Administration at OCJS for working with ODBN to make this project possible. We've spent more than $600,000 in CARES Act funding and hope to keep the program operating for the next two years with funding from the American Rescue Plan. We want survivors to know that we are here to provide referrals and resources for anyone experiencing intimate partner violence. I would like to now introduce Michaela Demi, ODBN's Policy Director and Staff Attorney. Good morning. It's so good to see you all here at the State House and on Zoom. I have the somber job this morning of sharing with you our annual fatality data. I would like to start by acknowledging that there is no way to honor all of the lives lost and the families grieving their loved ones in the time we have this morning. We are truly sorry for your loss. Our fatalities are collected each year from July 1st through June 30th. They're collected through media reports and through reports from our local programs. Each year's year when we discuss these numbers in October, more fatalities have occurred more recently that may be on our minds. Today, the lives lost in domestic violence incidents in Madison Township and right here in Columbus just this past week are on my mind. This past reporting year, there were 131 domestic violence fatalities in 90 cases. That is a 20% increase over last year's numbers and a 62% increase over the numbers from two years ago. There were 15 young people killed, the highest we have ever reported. 86% of the deceased were killed with guns, and that excludes law enforcement involved deaths. While no law enforcement lost their lives responding to domestic violence incidents in the past year, they were involved in the death of six perpetrators. I would like to draw attention to two themes that emerged from the data this year. First, the high rate of youth fatalities. Two of the young lives lost this past year were killed by an older dating partner. Teenagers are at risk in dating relationships and we must do better recognizing the danger that can exist in those relationships. In two separate cases, a man with a history of domestic violence killed two young children. In one case, the man shot his girlfriend's three young children. One of them has survived. In the other case, during a domestic violence incident, the mother ran down the hall to get help. And while she was gone, the man shot and killed their two children. This past year, there were also three separate cases where a husband and father annihilated his entire family using a firearm, shooting and killing his wife and all of his children in the family home. The loss for these families in these communities is unfathomable. The second theme that emerged were cases where law enforcement or the court were notified of the danger prior to the fatal incident. These cases are particularly important to review this year because they shine a spotlight directly on the legislature's efforts to overhaul bail and pretrial release systems here in Ohio. At least six incidents involved domestic violence perpetrators who had pending domestic violence related charges at the time of the deaths. At least two of those offenders had specific pretrial release conditions preventing them from having any contact with their victims. In two cases, the domestic violence victim called law enforcement, letting them know that additional acts of violence had occurred and they were afraid 
that those acts would continue and the offender would return. In one Cleveland case, while the domestic violence perpetrator was out on supervised release with a no contact order, he assaulted his victim again. Law enforcement was notified. Hours later, he returned to the, her home again and broke in. He was killed in the confrontation. Here in Columbus, a man with pending assault charges and an order requiring him to stay away from his victim came to her house and assaulted her. Law enforcement noted her injuries, but referred her to the prosecutor's office. The woman never made it to the prosecutor's office because she and her friend were stabbed to death hours later. While we cannot yet prevent all domestic violence homicide, these cases where the courts and law enforcement were involved are a key opportunity to improve our response to domestic violence. House Bill 3, Aisha's Law, also would improve law enforcement response to domestic violence by better accounting for lethality factors and providing more resources and information to victims at the scene. The legislature is considering bail reform in House Bill 315 and Senate Bill 182. These bills would make it even more difficult to keep dangerous domestic violence offenders from further harassing, assaulting, or even killing their victims. ODVN and its allies will continue to work with the House and Senate to keep the safety of interpersonal violence victims at the forefront of any improvements to Ohio's criminal justice system. ODVN stands today in remembrance of the lives lost to domestic violence and the families and communities mourning those losses. We work today and every day to help domestic violence victims get and stay safe, to improve community responses to domestic violence, to encourage the passage of laws to help prevent and reform responses to domestic violence, and ultimately to save lives. Thank you, Michaela. Let's take a moment to remember those lives we lost this year. We just have to do better. There's a person among us who is doing amazing things in this area. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ohio's Attorney General, Dave Yost, who has long been a champion against domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Most recently, the Ohio Knows campaign that ended this past week resulted in the arrest of 161 perpetrators. They assisted 51 potential victims, and they found 10 missing children. As you know, the Attorney General's office disperses the federal VOCA funds, so they're fully aware of how dire the situation has been these last years. Attorney General Yost, we appreciate that you, along with 52 county prosecutors, wrote to the Ohio legislators calling for money in our state budget to make up for the loss of that federal funding. My pleasure to introduce you all to Attorney General Dave Yost. Thank you, Bridget. Thank all of you for being here. When I first became aware of the issue of domestic violence in the 1980s, we didn't know anything about trauma or its long-term effects. Uh, in fact, it's kind of amazing to me, but the law at that time, at least in some states, said that domestic violence that happened in the privacy of your home was of no public matter, no public interest. It was a private matter between a man and his wife and whatever happened, happened as long as he didn't kill her. Amazing how far we've come in 50 years. Today, we understand that this isn't simply a mission of mercy, that it's not simply a compassionate thing to do, but that advocating for the victims, the survivors, 
of domestic violence is actually a good investment that a you know, child or a woman that has uh, encountered a DV experience by the time they're 64 will have uh, had an economic impact of $50,000 through nothing more than having witnessed that, uh, that trauma uh, because of psychological health effects uh, as well as economic impacts you know, stemming from loss of productivity uh, at work. So it's a good investment and I want to thank all of you advocates for standing and making the case, inviting the media and legislators into your operation to make the case. And I especially want to thank my friends in the legislature, uh, many of whom are here today, um, for putting seven and a half million dollars uh, in the 21-22 uh, biennial budget. That's real money. It's five million dollars more than had been in the 2019-20 budget. And because of term limits, I hope that you'll forgive me for noting this, but prior to 2019, there was no state line item at all to support this work, um, which made us an outlier among states. But I'm happy that uh, those days are long behind us. I look forward to working with all of you to maintain funding for this important work in the future. I especially want to congratulate uh, Cindy Abrams and uh, Nikki Antonio, um, who are about to receive uh, the Croucher Family Award, but we will allow that to occur in due order. Um, my main message today to you is thank you. Uh, this has been a time like no other uh, in my lifetime, I'm sure, in most of yours. And yet you've stood with resilience and courage. You've continued to advocate. We just talked about your advocacy at the state legislature, which has proven effective and brought the dollars that allows the work to continue. But you were effective in your advocacy with the federal government. Uh, I'm somewhat concerned, I think, about the uh, creeping entrepreneurial spirit within government that is focused more on dollars than outcomes, that on revenue streams than public policy. That's probably a speech for a different day. But at the very least, the decisions and programmatic changes that happened at the federal level at the Department of Justice that caused the diversion of funds that had previously gone to the work of advocacy and victim assistance has been remedied uh, through the VOCA fix. Again, your advocacy, your resilience, your persistence. Thank you. As important as those things are though, my main thanks to you today and to all of those of you who are watching out there in virtual land is the thanks that goes unthanked so often, unspoken so often for the work that you do every day. I'm trained as a lawyer and lawyers like to look at process and systems and those of us that are interested in the public good frequently dream that someday we will improve the system to make it more just, that we will leave behind us a society that is more righteous, more generous than the one we found. And we spend a great deal of time worrying about those systems. I was a prosecutor and in the criminal justice system, when I became prosecutor, all those high thoughts and systemic ideas kind of came crashing down. Not that they're not important. Um, I've been in legislative chambers and committee hearing rooms to testify on ways to change the law uh, and make our systems more just. But even when the law changes, it doesn't change everyone's life. If we pass a bill to allow expungement of criminal victims 
victims of uh, human trafficking uh, that sponge the criminal record as Senate Bill 4 and Stephanie Coonsey managed to get through a few years ago, still doesn't make any difference if the survivors are not empowered to actually go seek that expungement. It's, it doesn't make any difference unless the judges understand what the law is and how to apply it to produce a just outcome. What I found as a prosecuting attorney is that justice always happens one life at a time, one file at a time, if you will, one case at a time, but it's individual people working in individual cases for individual lives. And that's what I know firsthand that all of you do day in, day out, without anybody thanking you. Let me say today, thank you. You're changing the world, changing our society, one day, one day, one life at a time. And the accumulation of those individual goods will produce a very big good. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Attorney General Yost. And now we move to the presentation of the Leadership in Policy Awards and to present them is Donya Buchanan, our new ODBN board chair and our executive director, Mary O'Doherty. Good morning. I have the privilege this morning to introduce ODVN's inaugural Leadership and Policy Awards. ODVN is a network of 75 local domestic violence programs. Last year, we served over 111,000 survivors, including nearly 9,000 children. We sheltered nearly 7,500 survivors including nearly 3,000 children. Across the state, our programs answered on average 28 crisis calls per hour. Last year, we also faced some of our most drastic funding cuts, federal funding cuts to those programs being cut $7.7 .7 million. Every year, requests for funding services exceed our resources. 252 survivors in just one day were unable to be served. ODVN and our member programs turn to the Ohio legislature for support. In June, the Ohio House and Senate passed the biannual state budget, including $7.5 million for domestic violence um, survivor services, and Governor DeWine signed it into law. That was $5.5 million, a $5.5 million increase from the prior state budget. This critical funding helps our programs keep the doors open. Hotlines answered, and it provides life-saving services to families in need. We could not do this work without champions in the House and the Senate, representatives and senators. Who understand the need for survivor services. The following honorees are champions. Without their efforts on behalf of survivors, this critical funding would not have been included in the budget. We deeply appreciate each one for their support and we look forward to their continuing support for services here in Ohio. Please join me in thanking our honorees. Unfortunately, Representative Boyd and Representative Phil Plummer 
were not able to be here with us today. Representative Lanise, she was our key legislative champion in 2019. We wouldn't be here today if she hadn't been willing to step up for us in 2019, opening the door for us so that we could get additional funding in this budget cycle. Thank you. Representative Boyd, who is not with us today, has been a champion and a leader working to get Aisha's law, House Bill 3, passed to improve law enforcement responses to domestic violence and to improve safety outcomes for survivors. Representative Boyd also added specific funding for transportation for domestic violence survivors into the budget. Representative Carvania, he was an early and eager supporter of funding for our programs. He used his leadership role as assistant majority floor leader to support our funding. Thank you. Senator Dolan serves as the Senate finance chair and was on the budget conference committee. He gave us good advice and guidance when we met with him and he helped get this over the finish line. Thank you. Senator Kunzi, ODVN's oldest friend on the stage who helped us pass the final hurdle. Thank you. And Representative Phil Plummer, who again is not here with us today, with 30 years of experience at the Sheriff's Office working on domestic violence cases, he has been a natural ally at the State House and a responsive representative to Artemis Center. Thank you again for your support. We wanted to get a picture of all of you. Did we get the picture? Great. Let's have another round of applause for our champions. Each year, ODVN recognizes deserving recipients for outstanding leadership. The award is named after Jim and Elsa Croucher of Monroe, Ohio, who were plunged into the world of domestic violence when their 18-year-old daughter, Tina, was murdered by an abusive ex-boyfriend. Jim and Elsa overcame deep despair and pioneered a program to teach dating violence in all of Ohio schools. They reached nearly 100,000 students, and I had the pleasure of working with them. They saved lives through education, assisted victims when they chose to leave their abusers and stood beside survivors who were ready to break their silence. With fortitude and moral courage, they led the way and left a legacy through the passage of the Tina Croucher Act that mandates dating violence in all of Ohio schools. Elsa and Jim gave us all lessons to follow in faith, resiliency, and determination. Here to present this year's Croucher Family Award, ODVN Executive Director, Mary O'Doherty. State Representative Cindy Abrams, was a Cincinnati police officer and investigator before she became a politician. She worked on the domestic violence unit, so she's seen firsthand how domestic violence impacts families and communities. She's serving her first full term in the House where she represents part of Hamilton County. She's on the House Finance Committee. She's also a member of the majority leadership team. You know, she's been in the House um, only about two years, but her legislative record demonstrates that she has made a priority, priority of domestic violence survivors. 
She's the sponsor of House Bill 93, which makes important fixes to Ohio's address confidentiality law and which passed the House earlier this year. She's also a sponsor of House Bill 254, which would improve the way local domestic violence fatality boards do their work. When we asked Representative Abrams to help us increase state funding for our programs, her response was quick and resolute. Yes, she said. On behalf of ODBN's 75 member programs and domestic violence survivors across the state, thank you for getting House Bill 93 out of the House and for pushing our increased line item across the finish line. We are so pleased to present the Croucher Family Award for Outstanding Leadership to Representative Cindy Abrams. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Oh, first, okay. You're smiling first. Thank you, ODVN, for the important work that you do every single day here in our state. I am truly humbled and honored to receive this award. One of my main priorities has always been keeping people safe my whole entire life. I will continue to be a strong voice for Ohioans, and I truly appreciate this award. Thank you. Okay. Senator Nikki Antonio was elected to the Senate in, two, in 2018 after serving eight years in the House where she was also in leadership. She represents part of Cuyahoga County and she's also the assistant minority leader. Senator Antonio ran a substance abuse and outpatient substance abuse treatment program before she ran for office. A quick look at her legislative record shows that she's been a champion for equal rights for women, for the LGBTQ community, for children, people with disabilities, and of course, for making Ohio a better place for survivors of domestic violence. She's been an important advisor to ODVN this year, helping us with strategy and communications. When we asked Senator Antonio to give program staff some tips at our Advocacy Day event in March, her extemporaneous comments were so on point and so useful, we turned them into a training video. Senator Antonio, thank you for your advice and your counsel. Thank you for your moral support. Thank you for making us believe we could do this. It gives me great pleasure to present the Croucher Family Award for Outstanding Leadership to Senator Nikki Antonio. So unfortunately, Senator Antonio was not able to be with us in person. Um, she's recovering from back surgery, but she's here to speak about her award. Hi, this is State Senator and Assistant Minority Leader Nikki Antonio. I want to accept and thank the Ohio Domestic Violence Network's Croucher Family Award for Outstanding Leadership, and wish I could be with you in person, but I am at home recovering from spinal surgery, and I have to say, this is probably the best medicine receiving this award uh, to get me on the track to uh, health very quickly. You know, the domestic violence created the Croucher Family Award to recognize Jim and Elsa Croucher of Monroe, Ohio, who were trailblazers for domestic violence education in Ohio. The Crouchers became advocates after their youngest child, Tina, was tragically killed by an abusive ex-boyfriend. It's been an honor to work with ODVN over the years, and I want to thank you and the Croucher family from the bottom of my heart for the important advocacy that you do on behalf of victims and survivors of domestic violence in Ohio. 
the statistics that in regard to domestic violence are staggering and unacceptable. Ohio suffered 109 domestic violence t fatalities in the year ending June 30th, 2020. It was a 35% increase over the same period last year. These statistics are staggering and unacceptable. We simply must do everything we can to protect women, children, and family members who are victimized by domestic violence and the perpetrators of this violence. Now, over the years, I've worked on many pieces of legislation to protect victims and survivors of domestic violence, including our anti-strangulation bill with Senator Stephanie Kunze, it's Senate Bill 90. It expands the offense of domestic violence. It also prohibits knowingly, prohibits knowingly impeding the normal breathing or blood circulation of a family or household member by applying pressure to the throat. Um, it makes strangulation a felony rather than the current misdemeanor. This is critical and important legislation we need to pass this year. Senate Bill 90 has had two hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, and it's awaiting further hearings. We've also been working, my office and other colleagues have been working on ending the statute of limitations for rape and sexual assault. We know how important that is under the current code. Um, we have a 25-year window and a stop line on terms of the statute of limitations. We need to see that removed entirely. In addition to these bills, it's time, and I've worked before and will continue to work on removing the spousal exemption for rape in Ohio. Ohio is one of 12 states in which there exists this loophole that prevents a rapist from being prosecuted for spousal rape as long as there's no threat of force or violence existing. Um, this is just a little bit of the work that I would like to continue to do with your help, with your advocacy. Uh, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month is right now. We're in the middle of it in October. So during this time, I will cherish this award and help have it serve as a, as a reminder to me that I must do, we must do everything we can in order to ensure that all Ohioans can live safely without the threat of domestic violence in their homes. Again, I want to thank you so much for this honor, and I look forward to the work that we will continue to do together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. We hope you're back on your feet soon, walking these halls with that passion and energy that you exude on a daily basis. We want to congratulate all our legislative leaders. We appreciate all that you are doing. You get it. You understand that domestic violence isn't just about the victim. Domestic violence is a health and economic issue for our communities, our state as a whole. Studies show the staggering costs of billions of dollars each year through lost worker productivity, the justice system, police enforcement, and health care costs. But an investment in domestic violence services can save money. It saves the public a significant amount. Bethany House, the shelter in Toledo run by our chair elect Deidre Lashley, did a study that found that every dollar for every $1 invested in their agency, it saved the community over $65 in social costs, in addition to improving the health, safety, and well being of the survivors they serve. What a great ROI. Today, we celebrate the victories we've had over the past year, the VOCA fix, the increase in the line item, but our work is far from over. We appreciate the st state stepping up with the line item increase, but in reality, it is a small fraction of a shelter's budget. Programs are cutting staff, they're turning people away. On a single day last year, because of a lack of money, 252 victims were told they couldn't be helped. Where did they go? What did they do? 
Domestic violence survivor services continue to need stable and sustained funding from the state and federal budget to address the needs in our communities. We need to pass House Bill 3 to finally recognize strangulation as a serious life-threatening offense. We need to improve law enforcement response on the scene and to provide victims with more information and more resources. We need to take a hard look at how the criminal justice system addresses domestic violence charges, both pre-conviction and in sentencing and enforcement. We are calling on each of you to help legislators vote to support safety and options for domestic violence survivors. Program staff continue to educate your communities and ask for their support to prevent domestic violence. Committee, community members and allies call on your local representatives to support domestic violence services and survivor safety. Today, we mourn those victims who have died. We pray for the victims who are still in abusive situations, the ones who struggle with the aftermath of leaving, and we hold hope for the future of the children who have endured childhood trauma and the enormous journey they face in healing. We have extraordinary dedicated people in place creating and employing the best practices to care for victims, provide training, prevention, education, legal services, and policy change. Because of all of our team efforts, we can prevent domestic violence, and somewhere down the road, we can eliminate it. We can one day say there is no more. Thank you.